If possible, we'd like you to keep the camera off and keep yourself on mute. Um, we'll be having three speakers today, um, as well as myself, who I will be the moderator. My name is Joe Miller. I'm from the V13 Police Tech Accelerator. Um, and so we will be uh, recording the session and providing it on social media channels, as well as uh, on the V13 um, uh, video log as well. Um, thank you again for coming to the webinar entitled Innovation in Occupational Health and Safety in the Age of COVID-19. Again, my name is Joseph Miller. I'm uh, the Business Development Manager from the V13 Police Tech Accelerator. Can everybody hear me all right? I'm assuming so, hope so. Um, today, as I said, we have three speakers. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Chief Paul Vandergraaff. Uh, Paul Vandergraaff was appointed as the 13th Chief of Police of the Coburg Police Service on August 15th, 2019 by the Coburg Police Service Board. Paul began his police career in 1991 as a member of the Belleville Service, Police Service, working as a frontline constable. Over the course of his career, Paul had, has held new, a number of progressively responsible positions, including community policing officer, bike control, traffic services, criminal investigations focusing on sexual assault and child abuse investigations, uniform staff sergeant, inspector, and finally appointed as the deputy chief of police for the Belleville Police in 2010. On November 10th, 2014, Paul was appointed as the Deputy Chief for the po Coburg Police Service. Chief Vandergraaff is a member of the Canadian and Ontario Associations of Chief of Police. Paul currently serves as the Vice Chair of the National Joint Committee of Senior Criminal Justice Officials and a board member of the Ontario Police Technology Information Cooperative. Paul has always, always been and continues to be a strong believer in community volunteerism. Among his many volunteer roles, Paul has been an active Rotarian with the Rot Rotary Club of Belleville and now Coburg, and is honored to be a member of the YMCA Northumberland Board of Directors and Cornerstone Family Violence Prevention Center. In September 2016, Paul was invested as a member of the Order of Merit of the Police Forces by His Excellency, the Right Honorable David Johnston. Chief Vandergraaff is committed to enhancing the effectiveness of operational police services through effective deployment of resources in what has become known as tiered policing and innovation through the V13 Police Tech Accelerator. Welcome Chief Vandergraaff. The next presenter will be Ben Su, who is co-founder of AIH Technology. Ben leads the execution of AIH Tech's growth strategy, product development and revenue generation. Ben spearheaded AIH initiatives in building ethical and responsible applications using its proprietary technologies on projects with positive societal impacts. Ben played an instrumental role in launching Project Monicio to help create safe workplaces for post-COVID-19 world. The Monicio Essential Screening Station has received Health Canada authorization for use related to COVID-19. It is now automating workforce COVID-19 screening and staff visitor attendance management inside government buildings, senior homes, healthcare centers, manufacturing plants, and food processing facilities. Ben holds a Bachelor of Science and a Juris Doctorate degrees. He previously served as a member of the Canadian Bar Association's National Health Law Committee and the Legal Futures Initiative. Welcome, Ben Sue. Our third presenter will be Ben McCown. Ben is the commercial business manager with Team Eagle in Campbellford, Ontario. He has been with the company approximately seven years, starting as sales associate and working his way to his current role. Although Team Eagle is traditionally seen as an international company focusing on aviation technology, Ben and his team quickly identified the threats to the aviation market and the global need for COVID-19 technologies worldwide. Ben was able to quickly pivot Team Eagle's engineering team and design to, to design, develop, test, and manufacture a leading UVC cleaning technology to combat COVID-19 in the workplace. With the help from V13 Police Tech Accelerator, they were able to rapidly test and validate the technology's use for police services. 
As such, the technology now is in place in many essential services, services facilities, including police, fire, public works headquarters throughout North America and are seeing increased demand throughout the world. Welcome, Ben McCown. And myself, again, I'm the business development officer from Northumberland CFDC and the V13 Police Tech Accelerator. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the V13 Police Tech Accelerator, uh, we are a joint initiative of the Coburg Police Services and Northumberland Community Futures Development Corp that works collaboratively with companies, not-for-profits, academia, and government organizations to develop a pipeline from idea to implementation of innovative policing uh, technologies and best practices for community safety in Ontario and around the world. The V13 Police Tech Accelerator expounds on the existing reputation of the Coburg Police Service as a leading police service innovator, while creating an ecosystem for startups and a soft landing zone for innovative law enforcement companies into the Northumberland region. The V13 Police Tech Accelerator was designed to encourage innovation along a continuum from idea to early stage R&D, validation, and all the way through commercialization. We accomplish this through collaborations and demonstration projects through three principal program streams. Our pilot stream, excuse me, is a highly structured program that validates and demonstrates used by SMEs to test their technologies in uh, real world scenarios. Our startup stream is a competitive application-based program for specific calls of proposals developed by the Coburg Police Service. And our scale-up stream is a small investments vehicle used to support startups and SMEs in the police technology world. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Chief Vandergraaff, who will give an overview of the uh, case study that we have developed around operational uh, and safety initiatives in, uh, during COVID-19, um, at which time we'll open up for questions for five minutes and then move on to the additional presentations. Thank you very much for your time and enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, that bio, I got to do something about that. But um, listen, um, thanks everybody for taking some time out of your day today to join us in, um, in really understanding how we can, uh, can pivot so quickly. And that's going to be a word I'm going to overuse today. But um, the first slide you see before us is as we went to launch our Police Tech Accelerator, COVID was something that we were starting to hear about, but it was something that was happening abroad and we weren't too concerned about it. And we had a very different, um, a very different goal for our police tech accelerator. And that was, we were gonna have a meeting with chiefs from around the province and come up with two or three priorities. Well, then COVID hit and it became that unprecedented challenges that this pandemic made for us. And it became our only priority as the world shut down around us. And we're here, we're 14 months beyond that. And we're really not much further ahead in the sense of life being what it used to be. Immediately with the hit of this pandemic, the key for any leader of any organization was to keep its people safe. Um, we had to make sure that um, our employees, not only from a legal obligation, but from a moral and ethical obligation that our employees um, were safe when they felt safe when they came to work and were safe. It's added a little bit of a unique circumstance when you're talking about a police service. And not only like many businesses, we work 24 seven, 365 days a year, but we also have the added responsibility that if our folk can't come to work, our community can't be safe. So it really, really made it uh, an unprecedented situation from our aspect. And um, it's hard to believe, and I was just talking to somebody this morning that even to this day, um, 15 hours at least of every week is spent dealing specific with COVID related uh, in incidences. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Joe. So in this particular case study that I wanna speak about, um, I, I'm no real stranger to crisis. That's one thing about uh, being a police officer for as long as I have, as you heard by that ridiculous bio, um, that we, we tend to see a, a fair amount and we tend to learn to manage crisis, but this global pandemic has halted life as we know it. In fact, I heard somebody say not too long ago uh, on a podcast that this is this generation's World War II. This is this generation's where it's hit every country in the world where there are shortages of basic supplies, where general mobility is limited, where there's new laws created as a response. And I, and I, and, and it was, I just heard that last week and, I, and I, it's sort of where I live now. 
So when COVID hit us, we obviously received initial information from government and health regulators um, about what this was all about. And we were quickly trying to understand the seriousness. Is, is this like a bad flu? Is this like SARS that had some impact, but really minimal? And, and they constantly changed. We immediately went into the world of, do we have enough personal protection equipment? Um, is it available? Does it work? Are our people trained on how to use it? And again, like I said, not, not, not unique to many organizations uh, around the world that work 365 days a year, 24 seven, but we have overlapping shifts in a confined workspace. Um, so in other words, when the police officers and the civilian support staff come to work, they share workspaces. Sometimes a person will leave a workspace at four o'clock and a new person comes in at 405 and, and, is, and, and takes over that same workspace. Uh, we're, sharing, um, we're sharing vehicles on the road, we're interacting with, um, I like the slide, bringing non-cooperative individuals. Um, we're, we're dealing with people who, who may not want necessarily to deal with the police, let alone all the good folk that we, um, we stumble upon every day. And I remember when this first happened, one of our first um, issues of COVID uh, transference to a member, the person had to live in a hotel for 14 days. And it's amazing how quickly we really have grown. Uh, but we, we pivoted. And, and we learned exactly what um, we needed to do to keep our people safe. We recognized very quickly that there were some key holes in our plan. Although we had a pretty good pandemic plan, we didn't have a good method to track symptoms. So A, do, does all of our staff know what the symptoms of COVID are? Are we tracking that? Are we ensuring our people are not coming to work if they're feeling ill? Many, many businesses have reliability indexes where we give people some sort of benefit for no sick time. Um, are we really contact tracing? Yeah, we can say we know who's coming in the building and we, and we, we have um, a, an idea, but do we really know who interact with who? Um, and like our business, like many other businesses, we have remote people who are working from home. Um, and you would take for granted that, well, if they're working from home, our workplace is safe. Well, but are they able to do their work if they're not well? That's, that's a key, key issue for us. Um, and then you go to the cleaning. So we, we do a good job of cleaning, but are we, are we really cleaning the air and surface? And are we doing the best thing we can? Um, and through clear, clear communication, we were able to, to really nail down some huge opportunities. And um, this is where we began to work. Uh, next slide, please show. We started to work with some really innovative companies and credit to the CFTC because they're able to bring all of these people together. I, as a chief, if I was not part of as an accelerator, I would not have had access to Ben and Ben. I, I, yeah, maybe I would have known them or we would have crossed paths, but I would never have had the opportunity to access their, their brains and their smarts and their, and their innovation. And I'm telling you, it made a world of difference for our police service. And um, so we were able to work with them. We were able to test. I like how we put broke because that's what we in policing do. We break everything. So we were able to break some of the technologies. We were able to give some feedback. Um, we were able to uh, implement uh, different um, technologies, maybe one for the cell block, which was different than what uh, Ben Sue will speak to, but is another technology, all geared at making sure we were doing the best for our people. Prior to um, Ben McCowan's and, and Eagle's uh, UBC, we spent thousands and thousands of dollars on cleaning technology early on. And that was well-spent money, um, well-spent money because we needed to keep our cars with a, with a topical solution. The, the UVC solution has cut that budget line down amazingly. And when I presented my budget, I was able to say, this is gonna be different because of this advent of technology. Uh, next slide, I'm gonna move right to what happened here with us. So this is where it really gets interesting and you don't know how good you have it until you need it. So by this time, and um, we had deployed um, the municipal product at the, at the office. So all staff who attended at the police station or our other remote facility on Darcy Street screened in. So we knew who screened in, what day they screened in, that the screening automatically tested their temperature and we asked the standard COVID questions. So we knew at the start of every shift, somebody, um, was well and able to come to work. And the, all of our staff knew that if their health changed, they need to go home. So what happened was um, late in the day, it always happens on a Friday, uh, but late in the day, we were contacted by a member who had gone to the hospital 
and he had tested positive uh, with COVID. This particular member worked not only here at the Covert Police Service in our building on King Street, but also worked at the courthouse, which is up on William Street here in uh, 860 William here in Covert. And there by he was in contact with accused persons as well as court staff, meaning the Ministry of the Attorney General. So now uh, our members in the hospital, he's tested uh, positive with COVID. Within five minutes of me calling an emergency meeting, with all my command team to begin planning how we're gonna respond, I was able to pull the contact tracing sheet from the device. So I was able to, within five minutes, determine which staff were at highest risk and needed to get tested first. Obviously, we allowed anybody who felt they wanted to get tested to go get tested, and that was supported by Northumberland Hills Hospital. But we were able to start phoning those people. So quickly, we were able to determine that two additional subjects had also tested positive. Other subjects had tested negative, but we also learned that you can't test too soon because they ended up testing positive later. Immediately, we were able to move to the shared workspaces, um, the cars, the desks, the spaces, the cell block, and we were able to begin clean, cleaning that with now governmently proved through the University of I, Ben McCown will talk about how it was proven, but some great, great technology. We were able to, to, to secure my staff that we know who came in contact with the person. We know when they came in contact. We knew that they needed to get tested sooner than later. We created the opportunity to test everybody. We were able to clean our location. So from a police leader from the Occupational Health and Safety Act, for anybody in Ontario, as a manager, I exceeded every expectation of a, of a, of a manager or an owner of a business, all based on simple technology that would have never come in together had it not been COVID. So when we constantly deal in the world of negativity around COVID, I always try to find every day, I try to find a positive opportunity. The opportunity to come together with Ben and Ben, I should change my name to Ben, then it'd be really confusing for Joe. Um, but that it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, so at the end of the day for us, um, we can't avoid when you're gonna have um, a COVID outbreak in your, in your location. The fact that your pandemic plan is supported by innovative technology, supported by innovative business with innovative people created this workspace. And I can tell you when I speak to my peer group and I tell them how quickly we manage this outbreak, they can't believe it. And it goes right back down to knowledge is power. Um, again, I can go on about this forever and I'm sure I've missed about 15 things I probably should have said, but uh, I'll open it up to anybody to have any questions. And I'm sure uh, Joe will leave my contact information for anybody and I'm more than happy to answer questions after the fact. Should somebody be watching this recording, please uh, reach out to me. Thank you, Chief uh, Vandergraaf. If uh, anybody has questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section or the chat section. Um, and if there aren't any, um, I will move on to Ben Su from Monicio. Thank you very much, uh, Chief and Joe. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the opportunity that we had uh, with a COVID police service, as well as the V13 Police Tech Accelerator to first you know, formulate the innovation and understanding what the problems are, and then arriving at a solution path that led, to us, that led us to uh, where we are today. Uh, so just a summary, you know, when we first started this, we didn't know what are the occupational health challenges that managers like Chief Benegrab uh, were facing. And through, you know, site visits and also under, and simply just at, uh, learning from them about these challenges, um, we came up with, uh, you know, Monitio Intelligence, which is now uh, a Health Canada uh, approved uh, technology. So uh, this is, you know, a couple of bullet points uh, straight from the Ontario Ministry of uh, Labor website. So essentially, these are the goals or objectives that employers uh, are supposed to be uh, meeting in, in order to protect the health and safety of their employees. Uh, and it's very different from, you know, looking at the occupational challenges on the ground versus, you know, simply reading these uh, bullet points. So I'm very grateful for having the opportunity to, you know, uh, get into the, uh, where the actions are and 
apply our technology to solve those problems. Next slide, please. So just to summarize, uh, a lot of things that you, you've seen on the previous slide, you know, for example, developing a proper active COVID-19 screening protocol and having that information awareness, uh, but what does it translate in a product perspective? Well, first of all, we know that in COVID-19, you know, with these facilities that you're visiting, they require you to write down your name and your contact information uh, basically the signing process. And we know that you don't like to touch things. And that's why we made our entire you know, screening process touchless. And also at the same time, the chief had mentioned that you know, really tracking uh, the symptoms uh, that the workforce uh, members are experiencing, whether it being temperature or other you know, public health uh, required questionnaire items. Uh, we do a very good job in you know, keeping track of that information. And at the same time, attendance management, knowing who's in the building at what time, this can allow you uh, to develop information on contact tracing. So the case that the chief had mentioned, which uh, Monizio played an instrumental role in, uh, you know, flagging the people that may have been exposed and allow them to quickly, you know, develop a, uh, you know, response to that event. Uh, I thought, you know, that was uh, where our product had excelled in. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, uh, we have been working with uh, a number of manufacturing sites, food processing plants and uh, government police services. So uh, we had developed a protocol, I would say, you know, a plan to implement effective uh, active COVID-19 screening. So essentially, you, we set up uh, these checkpoints at the entrance of these uh, facilities. And we let the individuals entering the facility to uh, undergo a comprehensive uh, set of uh, screening procedures, including body temperature, public health questionnaire, contact information. And now in some other senior homes, uh, we actually uh, implemented a consent forms for receiving rapid antigen tests, right? So we're, we're all doing that automatically and touchlessly. And at these checkpoints, uh, if individuals meet the facility requirement, uh, they would be allowed to enter with their information locked into the system. And if they are, if they fail, for example, if they answer yes to the question of uh, have you traveled outside Canada in the past 14 days, then uh, we will send a real-time alert to the facility manager so they can take immediate action on deciding whether if that individual will be allowed on site. Next slide, please. So uh, really, I think like information, uh, situational awareness is the key. So having a readily accessible uh, log sheet of who's in the building at what time would allow facility managers to determine who's being exposed to whom and who needs to self-isolate and get tested. And I think this is one of the things that our uh, partners really enjoyed is that, you know, having that situational awareness. Next slide, please. And based on conversations with the chief of staff at hospitals, you know, public health experts, epidemiologists, uh, we learned that you know this virus will probably will be here uh, for the next for the next little while, and here's an interview by Dr. Gottlieb, who used to be the FDA director uh, and also the director at Pfizer, and he is saying that the virus will also will always circulate at a low level. Uh, next slide, please, and. Based on, on Dr. Fauci, some of his interviews, uh, he's indicating that you know breakthrough infections are here to stay, and no vaccine is 100%. So, for us, our conversation with the healthcare facilities, especially, they're saying that active COVID-19 screening will not be going away anytime soon, and that you know even if we are able to, uh, well, it's questionable. 
uh, that these experts are saying whether if we're able to achieve herd immunity. And if even if we're able to achieve herd immunity, it, it's also another risk that we need to consider about breakthrough infections. Uh, so yeah, so our product, basically, we want to make the world be able to be confident uh, to bring the employees back to the workspaces and that, you know, meeting the public health requirements of the Ministry of Labor is also an objective that we would like to make our partners uh, to achieve easily with our technology. Next slide, please. Yep. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, and also um, my contact information, I believe it's, oh, there's a question from Gary. The question is, you're probably not the only COVID-19 screening solution out there. What are one or two things that set you slash money to apart? That's a great question. So uh, we see there's a lot of uh, companies that are working on, you know, for example, uh, temperature screening. And what we learned from the occupational health and safety side is that what they really would appreciate is a full cycle screening process, meaning contact information for contact tracing, as well as answering the government required uh, public health screening questionnaire. So for example, their exposure history in the past 14 days, had they been meeting with people who travel outside of Canada, uh, so having this comprehensive uh, screening protocol built in the system, uh, providing that one-stop shop solution, I thought that was a, you know, a game changer for our uh, operators. And in addition, I think earlier on, we had the opportunity to uh, work with you know, Health Canada's uh, medical device licensing uh, department, uh, which allowed us to you know, implement a various of engineering designs that we ensure the product efficacy as well as you know, uh, safety. So our product, I would say, having gone through the Health Canada authorization process allowed us to be on a higher level in terms of you know, being an effective and safe product for users uh, to operate. Thank you, Gary, for the question. I see okay. that there's no more question. Then I have a question. Could yes, you explain, please. Or could you explain to everybody the iterative process um, and the benefits of working with frontline officers and frontline uh, workers in building the technology to kind of fit their needs? Right. So, I mean, it's one thing to design a product on paper, thinking that users will, you know, go this way when the product's implemented. It's another thing to hear directly from the frontline uh, officers uh, who are you know, using this product daily to screen themselves. So one of the things I thought that was very useful was uh, we had um, the opportunity to speak directly with an officer. Or her, uh, she mentioned that you know, in the morning when you have shift changes, sometimes you have a peak traffic time. And, these congestions at, the, at these COVID-19 screening checkpoints can really hold back, uh, you know, hold everyone back, then sometimes there could be lineups. So having this type of feedback, uh, we thought of ways to accelerate that screening process. And one thing we did is to introduce a QR code scan, which cut down, you know, answering the public health questionnaire from as long as one minute to as low as 10 seconds, because what they can do now is get their temperature taken and the facial recognition piece will just pick, pick up their uh, personal info and they can answer the public health questionnaire on their own smart devices without you know, um, touching the screening station and allowing the immediate next person to use the station. So that has reduced the congestion at these uh, COVID-19 screening checkpoints by a significant margin. That's a great question, Joe. Uh, Joe, I'm gonna jump in here as well. Uh, to Gary's question and to your question, why would you pick this device over any other device? Because this device will grow with you. 
Um, this, di this, this device will become what you need it to become. Um, and the company AIH is really good at that. And Manisha is really good at that because we are now going to be working at drafting uh, a direct contact to uh, touchless uh, payroll submissions for part-time and casual employees. So their facial recognition will, will, will check their in, they'll check because now we check out too. So we want to know that our employees are going home well as well as coming in well. And we've allowed it now. So if there is an emergency in the building, if I need to know who was in the building in the case of an evacuation, I could remotely print that contact list out. And these were all ideas that grew. And we said, hey, Ben, throw this in there and tell me what comes out of the other end. And that's why you pick this company over another one. Thank you very much. And those are very awesome feedbacks that help to guide the product development. So we appreciate those. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Uh, next up, we have Ben McCown from Team Eagle. Hi, everybody. Uh, ben McCown from Team Eagle here in Comfort, just between uh, Peterborough and Belleville. Um, we are members of the uh, <coughs> Northumberland uh, group there that connected us with uh, Joe and that. So that's why we're here. We um, This is the uh, unit that I'm going to be uh, discussing and kind of our trials with it and how it's gone from uh, something that was uh, thought of um, in our garage by our mechanics and us to uh, around the world. And uh, we actually have units in Moscow and, and uh, Uzbekistan now too. So um, if we uh, can go to the, here we go. So uh, UVC Tech, we're, we're primarily a aviation company. As uh, Joe said in my bio, uh, we deal with uh, a lot of the software surrounding aircraft landing at airports and making sure that they stop effectively. Um, I won't put you to sleep on that kind of stuff because it puts me to sleep. Uh, so one of the things that happened though, when we, uh, when COVID hit was the airlines airports all froze up. And, uh, as you can tell, it's uh, the hardest hit industry probably by this. Um, uh, and they still have to stay open because they're still running cargo and there's still emergency flights coming in and out and, uh, flying an emergency personnel around. And when the winter hits, um, our friends in Toronto and our friends in the U.S. Air Force uh, were saying, well, we got to share these uh, these very special, unique vehicles. Some of them cost uh, up to $2 million a piece. Uh, how can we clean the inside of them safely? We can't spray them down. We can't uh, wipe them down uh, because uh, the insides are damaging. So we saw that uh, UVC was being used in the healthcare sector, uh, and we saw that there was a portable one going into aircraft. So looking at that, uh, we decided that the best way to protect the these uh, employees would be to uh, use UVC light. Uh, our unit, we realized it had to be portable because uh, any any industry, uh, airports, police, fire, they have fleet vehicles. Um, you want to make sure that uh, it can get out to wherever they're parked because the fire, uh, firefighters get to park their uh, uh, trucks in a nice warm, uh, nice warm interior, but uh, police cars, uh, airport vehicles are always parked outside. So we wanted to use the power from the uh, from the vehicle itself if needed. And uh, that's how we got to this. So uh, when we, we were kicking this idea around, um, Wendy at uh, uh, one of Joe's colleagues heard about it and said that we should connect with uh, Chief um, Paul Vandergraaf. So we did. Um, and uh, probably think you go to the next slide there, Joe. And some of the questions that came up from him, uh, we have heard from dozens of other police chiefs and police purchasing departments. I was just on the phone with uh, Mesa County Sheriff's Department in uh, Arizona uh, before this. And they asked the same as the second question, but the first one that uh, Chief asked was, can we use it in the station, like the cell areas and break rooms? And uh, even though we developed it to be used as a vehicle only solution, uh, we were able to say, yeah, we just got to change it back over to the AC power. So we converted it from AC back to, to DC, back to AC now. Uh, and that's commonly being used by the firefighters as well when they came in uh, later on. Um, and uh, one of the issues that was uh, brought up right away was, as a, uh, you know, SARS is here now and probably for a while, but uh, what about uh, hepatitis, tuberculosis, and all those other um, not so fun things that uh, police officers and other frontline workers have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and will for the foreseeable future. Uh, and so we dug into it and uh, it found, we found out, yes, it does kill all those too. You know, UVC does kill uh, pretty much everything. It will kill us if we stand in front of it long enough. Um, and, uh, the other question you had was that, uh, police officers and, uh, firefighters, paramedics, they have a lot of PPE that cannot just be thrown in the washing machine at the end of shift. Uh, can it be used on that? And, uh, the solution we got back from our light supplier was yes. Uh, in fact, a lot of hospitals were already using the lights on, um, 
servicing their masks back when they, we had the mask shortage at the beginning of COVID. Um, so uh, Coburg agreed to do a, a trial for us to show us how this would be used in the uh, in the uh, policing world, and uh, we were very happy for that because we got to uh, we got to get some firsthand feedback, and we have no experience in law enforcement. So uh, here's a quick video of uh, my new friend Todd throwing the unit in a uh, uh, if it'll load here in the uh, cruiser. It might not load, Joe. We might have to. We could probably just send it out after as well. Um, so Joe and the team there at the police tech accelerator, they created a matrix for uh, the guys that are using it and girls using it to uh, fill out and uh, get kind of feedback. So based on what we learned from Coburg, we were able to safely put it out uh, to other law enforcement uh, agencies. Uh, Chief Landegraff also connected us with the uh, fire departments and uh, Coburg fire. Uh, and then it really kind of grew from there. We got, we ended up selling a lot of units to the fire departments as well um, based on, uh, based on what they were uh their, their needs are. Uh, it was a little different, you know, fire trucks are obviously quite large, but they also started using them on their PPE and in and around their workstations. Um, it really is helpful for uh, volunteer fire departments. Uh, we found where they had exposure. Uh, when one crew came in, they were able to say, okay, well, the next shift that comes in, we clean the, uh, we clean the uh, trucks so that uh, we don't have to worry about any uh, overlap of exposure to them. Um, the, uh, I think that's that's it for this slide, and I think that's kind of where we ended up uh, going. So uh, throughout the trial, as it was taking place, um, uh, we, we were able to uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we were able to uh, you know potentially help contain the outbreak that uh, Chief Anagraf talked about. It forces it up to anyone's grab, but it makes him look good. It makes us look good, maybe. So uh, we'll uh, we'll say we we contributed a little bit. Uh, able to clean the air prior to uh, when when he has the um, uh, what did you call them? Non-cooperative folks come back. Uh, sometimes they leave messes in the cells uh, and you have to go in there and clean that regardless. So uh, before sending in uh, anyone to clean it, yeah, you want to make sure you're cleaning the air because as this trial was going on, it was becoming more and more uh, relevant to the public that COVID-19 was uh, spreading through the air. Uh, and UVC, as people are starting to see now pop up in all sorts of HVAC systems, uh, does a very good job of cleaning the air. So prior to the Chiefs guys going in there and cleaning up any any messes that might have been made in the cell area, they're able to clean the uh, the air before they breathe it in. And then also importantly is while we were at, uh, while the trial was going underway, uh, Western University had the light board that we use and they uh, were testing it on a strain of SARS-CoV-2, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, we were very fortunate because it's the only test that has happened in a Canadian lab so far using UV sea light to combat uh, COVID. Um, they're very, it's very hard as you would imagine to get a, get a test like this set up. Uh, and uh, we were able to come back and when we told, when the trial started, we told Joe and the chief and his team that you need to wait 10 minutes for a cruiser because it's got to reach 10 millijoules per centimeter square. And what uh, Western told us was that we were actually killing it with just 10 which meant that uh, Paul and his group were able to say, Chief and his group were able to say, well, we can now uh, let everybody know that it only takes four minutes to do a cruiser. Um, and then having that data, I think, really gives uh, everybody a much more uh, sense of confidence uh, when they're going in and out of work because uh, there's a lot of uh, knockoffs on the market right now. We've been hammered by the EPA and Health Canada over the knockoffs that you'll see. And I caution you when you go online to buy one for your house, make sure that there is some sort of evidence. Um, but by Western University doing this, it was able to give us a good tool and uh, and uh, any police service and first responders using it um, to know that if there was potentially a uh, outbreak um, or somebody came into contact with somebody who had COVID, uh, that this unit is proven to kill COVID. So it's able to give them some, uh, uh, some comfort because at the end of the day, <clears throat> it is just a light. So it's pretty weird to imagine it cleaning, cleaning a, a room now. So that's uh that's my big spiel um and if anybody has any questions for me let me know uh they also have my contact information as well so uh, happy to answer any questions that might come up that's uh after joe i'm just going to jump in again here just quickly here while the questions are coming every time we have an accused person in a cruiser we use the device to uh to, to, to decontaminate the back of the cruiser we don't know we don't ask we just clean um, in our outbreak, we were able to go backwards and say, okay, where was the individual? Where was the employee in the change room? So we're able to do the entire change room. We were able to move this device around because our team 
had confidence in it. It created a sense of calm during a really, really stressful time in the outbreak in our police service. And uh, we obviously have community image that we always are trying to protect. So all of these pieces coming together allowed our outbreak really to be a non-break in that we moved through it. Our people recovered well, they're all back to work, which is the, again, the, the only thing that really matters. But it, uh, it's really important to instill the confidence in your staff that you have the best tools at your fingertips. And, and, and we're lucky to have that. Thanks, Chief. All right. Um, so at this point, it appears that we don't have any questions for Ben McCown. Um, I'd like to thank everybody, uh, especially Ben, Sue, Ben McCown, and Chief Paul Vandergraaff for their time today. Um, we'd also like to thank all the attendees uh, for your questions and your participation um, and taking the time today to uh, view kind of the case study that we put together uh, based on the activities at the Coburg Police Service and the Venture 13 Police Tech Accelerator. Um, again, this presentation has been recorded and will be up on social media, uh, as well as our Venture 13 uh, video library, um, which can be reached at uh, the Venture 13 website. Thank you again, and hope everybody had an enjoyable and uh, uh, wonderful day today, and I uh, look forward to reaching out to you all if you have any additional questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.